All right. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Awesome. All right, here we go. We are in we are in part four. Or not part four, I'm sorry. What week are we in? It's amazing. I have a different perspective than you. Uh, okay, so we're in part seven, but today uh, we're actually going to be breaking into chapter four. And I got to tell you right up front, out of all the chapters in this book, this epistle to the Hebrews, uh, I'm going to tell you, this one is unique. This one stands out amongst the rest. And the reason I say that is because this is a chapter that has prompted more discussion. This has cultivated more debate, cultivated uh, more perplexity, and even, I would say, confusion than any other chapter in this epistle. In fact, I can tell you personally, over the years, I've received more emails, more questions in regard to Hebrews chapter 4 than all the other chapters put together. And that is without exaggeration, which is going to make this a very interesting chapter to go through and, and to look at. There's a lot of perplexity that has arisen in regard to how the writer has structured his thoughts. I want to be clear on something. There's no debate, there's no confusion in regard to his primary point that he wants to make, that he is laying out. That's very easy to spot. And as we go through this, you'll see this. Where it, gets, it can get a little confusing, somewhat perplexing, is the way he chooses to develop his ideas. He's introducing elements, and you're going to see this, elements of association. And it's almost at times, it seems very disjointed, like he's literally just pulling a statement out of thin air and throwing it into the mix. And so we're going to be looking at this chapter very, very closely. And, you know, my hope is for if you're one of those that have gone through Hebrews chapter four and you come out and you come out, what is he trying to say here? Why is he making this particular statement in this context? I think you're going to be blessed as, as we go through this. So with that said, let's break into this, and we're going we're gonna to circle back to Hebrews chapter 3, and I, I really just want this to be seamless as we go into 4 so we have some context. But this is what we read. Now, with whom was he angry with 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And I love this, the traditional Jewish fashion of asking questions, teaching through asking questions, rhetorical questions. Now, obviously, what he's stating here is that the reason our ancestors fell in the wilderness, one reason, they sinned. They failed to follow the Most High God. Moving on to verse 18. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? Now, I've highlighted his rest because I want you to understand this is the primary point. As we get into chapter 4, this is what the writer is fixated on. He's consumed with this idea of bringing God's rest into the mix and sharing this reality with his brethren. Very, very powerful. And so looking at verse 18, re -re going to the beginning again, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter? You pick up on that? Because just go read the Torah. And what you will find is God swore to bring them into the land. He swore it. That's why this statement, and the writer of Hebrews is drawing from Psalm 95. The, at the very end of the chapter, remember, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Do you see how jarring that should be? Because he swore to them that he would bring them into the land. But now he's swearing promising you will never see the land. What happened? Sin. So, and, and I point this out because you get into these conversations where the enemy has sown seeds of deception within the church that their salvation is unconditional. No matter what they do in this age, it's irrelevant. You read the Torah, you find out the exact opposite. 
You find out, in fact, in Deuteron- Deuteronomy, Numbers 14 is where God makes the proclamation where he swears, not one of you shall enter in the land except for Joshua and Caleb. You all die in the wilderness. This is an amazing thought. It's frightening, and it's meant to put the fear of God in you, and this is exactly what the writer is doing with his own Jewish brethren, trying to rattle them. And so to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. Again, just going back to this reality that the writer equates disobedience to that of unbelief. And you flip that upside down, that would mean faith is equated to obedience. And, and what does James say? Faith without works is dead. Show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. See, that's a real, when a tree is good, it does what? It bears fruit. This is what it does. It bears fruit. That being said, let's break into Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, a promise remains. The first thing I want to point out here is look at this. It tells us the promise has not been yet obtained. We have not experienced it. It hasn't been fulfilled. It still remains. We have not entered his rest. How peculiar is that statement? In light of what we read in the Old Testament. What do we read in the Old Testament? You go to the Old Testament, you see the exact opposite. You see Israel actually obtained it. They went into his rest, they received the promise. Let me share with you some scriptural passage, passages. And this is really going to help put this into context. So the Lord gave to Israel all the land which he had sworn... To give to their fathers. And they took possession of it. And dwelt in it. Now look at this. The Lord gave them rest all around. They entered into his rest. And it wasn't just any rest. Look at what it goes on to say. According to all that he had sworn to their fathers. It was rest according to promise. That's what this is. They experienced it. They entered into it. It was fulfilled. And not a man of all their enemies stood against them. Total deliverance, total peace, total shalom. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Jumping ahead to chapter 22, Joshua reiterates, And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brethren, how? As he has promised them. Now therefore return and go to your tents and to the land of your possession. Over and over again, there's this, without ambiguity, They experienced God's rest. They experienced God's promise. It was fulfilled. Let me show you one more. We're going to go later in time. We're going to come to a time of Solomon. Then Solomon, he's dedicating the temple. Then Solomon stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice saying, Blessed be the Lord who, what? Has given rest to his people Israel. And it's according to all that he promised. All. All. According to everything that he has promised, we have experienced it. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses. So somebody explain to me, what in the world is this writer talking about when he says a promise remains of entering his rest? When all you need to do is you need to go to their history. It's written down. They experienced it. They had it. This is what they had. Well, to answer that question, the writer understood something very critical. And if we don't see this, if we don't know where he's coming from, chapter 4 is going to be miserable for you. We need to understand this concept. See, the writer understood something about promise. God's promise. He understood something about God's rest. He understood something about biblical prophecy. And this is huge. This will change the way you read the Bible. This will change the way you read the Torah. There's a nice little helpful term for us that we use today. And it's called an inaugurated eschatology. 
And for those of you who are not familiar with the term eschatology, it, it just, it's, it's a study of end-time events. Eschatos, or eschatos, in, in the Greek, refers to last. Okay, so when you're dealing with eschatology, we're talking about the end. And the study of then, inaugurated, when you put this together with eschatology, it is telling. It tells the story. And inaugurated eschatology tells you that with prophecy, with God's promises, they can legitimately be experienced, be fulfilled during the very era by which the promise was made. But ultimately... A final fulfillment will happen sometime in the future. See, this is the difference between understanding God's promise on a temporal level or experiencing God's promise on an eternal level. Vastly different. And yet, legitimately, I can say, no, Israel, when you look at the land, they experienced the promise. Everything that was written was true. They experienced the rest of God. They experienced the promise of God. Understand something, but it was on a temporal level. See, but the eternal rest, this is what the writer of Hebrews understands. He understands this very clearly. We have not yet entered into that. And that much is clear. See, because we'll never enter into that until one thing happens. Something specific has to happen. And the apostle Paul tells us what that is. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us, when? When the Lord Yeshua is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That's when this is going to happen. This is the curse. This is what we need to look for. When we know we entered into that final fulfillment of what was promised. And this is exactly where the writer of Hebrews is coming from here. When he says, a promise remains of entering his rest. See, just this Jew speaking to his other Jews in the first century in the land knew that what he experienced was not what God had ultimately promised. Now that's challenging. I mean, when, you, when you're challenged with that reality, because it tells me something about the writer it tells me he's reading scripture differently than a lot of people are today. That's what this tells me. Because he's still using the Torah. He's using the prophets. But he's recognizing, no, no, something's off here. And keep in mind, the context here, oh yeah, the writer is writing to other Jews. In first century, there were Jews living in the promised land. This is an absolute fact. We could say scriptural fact because we have testimony of the New Testament. There were Jews living in the promised land. Oh, and beyond that, they had fun something far superior than to what the Jews have today in Israel. They had a functioning temple. They actually had a functioning temple. The sacrifices, the prayers, they were happening. The mikvah, the priests going in. It was amazing. These things were happening in his days. And yet he's looking around going, this is not it. This is not it. I want to take you to the Torah. And what I want to do is I really want to build into this concept of an inaugurated eschatology. I want to build into the concept of where the writer is coming from, his mindset, and how he reads scripture. And I, I think this is going to be very helpful. And this all plays into the subject. Going to Deuteronomy 6, 17, this is what we read. You shall diligently, what? Keep the commandments. And in Hebrew, to keep is shamar. We are to guard. We're to protect the commandments of God. This is what we're commanded to do. You shall diligently guard the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. All right. Moving on to verse 18. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord. Okay. So I'm going to pause here for a second because this is important. To keep the mitzvot, to keep the commandments of God, in God's eyes, this is what is right. This is what is good in his sight. All right? Then it goes on to say that it might be well with you, and what? That you may go in and possess the good land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. That is amazing. So if you keep the commandments, you're going to be brought into the promised land. 
Now, what is the reverse of that? Well, if you don't keep the commandments, you will not be brought into the promised land. Understand something. This passage is an amazing example of an inaugurated eschatology. Because the, in the days that this, this passage was actually quoted, as you have Moses declaring this to Israel, there was a real-life practical application to them. He was speaking to the generation that was the children of those that were wasted, that died in the wilderness. And he told them, if you do this, if you keep the commandments, you're going to go in. And guess what? They did. They went in and they literally experienced a taste of this rest. They experienced God's promise. And then it was true. But it was inaugurated. This was not, this was temporal. This was not eternal. And you hardly need me to tell you this because all you need to do is look at the history of Israel. When Joshua brought them into the land and all their enemies fell, the Lord destroyed them all and they had all this beautiful rest. Is that the end of their story? That is not the end of the story. Their story is fraught with tribulation. Their temples being destroyed. Babylon carrying Israel off. Do you think Israel, as they're being carried off into Babylon, are, are thinking to themselves, wow, this is an amazing rest of God. We're really experiencing the promise here in its fullness. Absolutely not. See, it only takes one of those experiences to, you know, well, wait a second. <laughs> Time out. What God has promised us, this isn't it. Our people being carried off into Babylon, this is not what God ultimately promised Abraham. What God promised Abraham, our rest would be uninhibited. No one could interfere. Our enemies will forever be destroyed. This is what they're waiting for. Which, let's take this a step further. When we actually read this passage, the Torah, in the way that the writer of Hebrews reads it. Talk about opening new profound doors. Because when we look at this, and then it tells us, number one, we're to keep the commandments of God. And if we do keep the commandments, then we're going to be brought into the promised land. And we're going to be brought into the good land. We're going to have rest. When you read this at an eternal level, what does that do to you? What does that do to your perspective of the Torah? I'm going to tell you, it makes the Torah relevant for you today. If the Christians only knew how prophetic the Torah is, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. There would be more books on the shelves about Bible prophecy that stem from the Torah than have ever been written on Revelation. If they looked at this, and understood it the way the apostles read it. And understood it the way the writer of Hebrews read it and understood it. This ultimately, right here, and the rest of ultimately is talking about his eternal rest. About being brought into the kingdom of God. See, now if we go out and we tell our Christian brothers and sisters that this is about the kingdom of God, well, that's a completely different perspective. Because now all of a sudden... You just start to destroy the work of Hasatan. You start to destroy the work of the devil who has told him there's no relevancy here. The Torah, it's, it's antiquated. It's done away with. There's nothing for you Christians there. We have the gospel now. Don't go there. It's preaching the kingdom of God. Think about this. It's as relevant as you could possibly get. And let me support this because I'm going to take you to the New Testament. And I want to take you to this interchange that happens between a lawyer and Yeshua. And this is what we read in Luke 10. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And I always say, I love this passage. I teach on it often. It's the million-dollar question. We're in the New Testament. This guy's asking nobody better than he could ask. What do I do to inherit eternal life? And what is Yeshua's response? He said to him, what is written in the Torah? What is written in the Torah? In other words, go back to the Torah because it proclaims how you enter into the kingdom of God. How you enter into eternal life. What is written in the Torah? 
See, this is something that we, in these dark days, days that have deception, that the deception is so intense that if it were possible, the elect could be deceived. These are the things that need to come forth in the church. An awakening needs to happen to truth. Because you need truth now, more than ever. With all the lies that are going on, the media is a septic tank of lies. The internet is a septic tank of lies. It's sad. So we need this. We need Torah. We need truth. So Yeshua turns this expert in the Torah. Go back to the Torah. Tell me what it says. And this is how he responds. Pay close attention. So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. I'm going to stop right there. Do you know where that comes from? It comes from the very passage I just had on the screen in Deuteronomy 6. This is essentially how the passage begins. And then it goes to define how you love the Lord your God. By keeping his commandments and doing what is right in his eyes. What does it say in the Ten Commandments? He shows mercy to thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments. That's where the mercy is going to be acquired. That's how you're going to get to go see the good land. That's how you're going to get to experience the eternal rest of the living God. And then he says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Comes from Leviticus, again from the Torah. Leviticus 19.18. I mean, straight out of the Torah. And Yeshua said to him, you have answered rightly. Look at this. Do this. Do it. And you will live. Now that's an amazing statement because as you go throughout the Torah, this is the cry. It's a battle cry. Do the commandments. Right? This is what over and over again, uh, James 1.22. Uh, that we're to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Deceiving ourselves. Isn't that interesting? That James has to add that. That last statement of deceiving yourselves. There's deception in regard to obeying God's commandments. There's deception that's going to come in. There's deception you're going to face where beguiling tongues are going to seduce, attempt to seduce you. Walk away. Walk away from the commandments of God. Don't listen to it. You think of Paul in Romans 2.13, for not the hearers of the Torah, the law, are just in the sight of God, only the doers. And this is exactly, it comes from the source, from Yeshua right here. Do this and you will live. In other words, do these things. You went to the Torah, it proclaims the kingdom of God. Now, if you hear it and do it, you will live. Amazing statement. Matthew 19, same, not the same story. This is a young rich man. Now behold, one came to him. Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? The question, what do we do? So Yeshua said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. This is the kingdom of God. You want to enter into the kingdom of God? You must keep the commandments. So here's my point. When we read Deuteronomy 6, and it tells us that we need to keep his commandments to enter into the good land, understand this. It's not temporal, ultimate. It's talking about the kingdom of God. It's talking about living in eternity with Yeshua. And this is exactly what the writer of Hebrews understands as we're breaking into chapter 4. This is an important backdrop. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest... Let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Doubling down on the fear. Because remember, he already brought Psalm 95 to the table. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. Don't do it. When your fathers tested me, they tried me. Though they saw my works 40 years. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. He doubles down and says, look it, be careful. Or you could come short of it. Again, I tell you, does this sound unconditional? Where you said a prayer one time and you're good. You're fine. Even though you've let your time in prayer slack, it's okay. Even though you're not reading the Bible like you used to, it's okay. Even though you're not attending church the way you used to, it's fine. You start to notice more and more your friends are those who aren't believers. It's fine. It's okay because you know what? I'm saved. It's okay. No, it's not okay. None of that is okay. 
Unless you're pressing in with all your heart, your soul, your strength, seeking the Lord, seeking first the kingdom of God, you need to get back on the path. So the writer double downs here, and then he goes on to say in verse 2, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Hold on a second, because this is important. Who is this them? He's explicitly referring to, and if you want to understand the, the weight of this statement, you have to identify who is them. I get the us. I mean, you have a Jew talking to the other Jews in the first century. That's simple enough. But who's the them? It's the people that died in the wilderness. It's his ancestors who entered into covenant with the Most High God. They received the Torah. These are the ones who received the Torah. And what does he say? The gospel is preached to us as well as to them. Revolutionary statement. Will revolutionize the way you look at the Torah. Because for the gospel to be preached to them, that would suggest, that tells, the gospel is in the Torah. Talk about having to rewire everything we've been taught. The gospel is in the Torah. This will affect the way you read scripture. This will affect the way a Christian should look at the Torah. Those two words, you know, you look at this, those two words have been made to oppose one another. And I'm referring to the Torah and gospel. They're the antithesis today, the way the church paints it, is it's the, they are the antithesis of one another. How very progressive. I mean, we're living in this time where things are just so progressive, where you cast off God's law. The Torah preaches the gospel. And this is why Yeshua says in John 5, uh, 46, around there, he says, if you believed Moses, Moses represents the Torah. If you believed Moses, you would believe me. Because he wrote about me. He wrote about me. We should not be surprised that the Torah preaches the gospel when the Torah is all about Yeshua. And again, this is about changing perspectives. The devil has changed the perspective of many good Christians. And he's put people on the pulpits to help with that. That the Torah is antiquated. It is done away with that. It has nothing to do with the gospel. It has everything to do with the gospel. Continuing on, listen to what he says. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith with those who heard it. They had the word. They had the gospel preached to them, but because they did not believe. See, when you don't have faith, I mentioned this last week, when you do not have faith, you will not walk in obedience because it takes faith to walk in obedience. See, because when you get literally confronted with these nasty trials and tribulations, when the enemy is like surrounding you and just assaulting you from every side, I'm going to tell you right now, the only way you're, you get that shield of faith to quench all those fiery darts of the devil, you need that shield. You need to have that faith. You're going to get picked apart. Powerful, powerful statement. Moving on to verse 3, and I'm going to put this up here with verse 2. For we who have believed do enter that rest. For we who have believed, we do enter that rest. And obviously it's through faith. This is what he's saying. We enter this rest through faith. Now all this perplexity and all this confusion that I've been talking about, I mean, up to this point, everything's very clear. There's no issues. But now we're going we're gonna to get into some murky waters here. He goes on and says this, As he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, if you just look at this as is, it seems very disjointed. Because for we who have believed do enter that rest, and then he goes to quote scripture, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. It sounds like a complete contradiction. 
See, what you would expect him to do is to go back to the Torah and show, yes, for we who have believed do enter that rest. Now give me a scripture to support that. Because he says, as he has said. But then what does he do? He goes, and he goes the exact opposite direction. He goes to Psalm 95, the end of it, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And so what I want to point out here is grammatically, the writer hasn't lost his mind. He is structuring this in a way that contrasts. He is contrasting those of faith with those who don't have faith, the righteous with the wicked. And this is very important. Look at verse 2. For indeed the gospel was preached to us, the faithful, the righteous, as well as to them. Contrast. The wicked, the ones who did not walk in faith. Going to verse 3. For we who have believed do enter that rest. Again, the righteous. So as he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter that rest. Contrast to the wicked. You got that? This is very clear. Unfortunately, that's not the end of it. Then he throws this statement in the mix. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So many people, and I've dealt with this. What, what does that mean? First he says this. Then he says, so I swore in my wrath. And then he says, although the works. It sounds like he's just grabbing statements right out of the air and throwing them in the mix. What are we supposed to do with this? What does this mean? This statement pertains explicitly to God's rest. That's what it means. Now, just to help you along with this, let me take you back to the 16th century. In the 16th century, something uh, very influential that would forever change the way we read our Bibles happened. And that is, we came with a structure of reference a better structure for referring, going back to the Word of God to organize our Bibles. It's called chapter and verses. See, they don't come in the manuscripts. All these Greek manuscripts that we're getting our translations from today, they did not contain chapters and verses. And coming in the 16th century, we added that to clarify, to organize these thoughts. And they're very helpful today. I love them. They help you remember. They help you to go back. Oh, yeah, Psalm 95. Now I can go back to Psalm 95, verse what? Six. Oh, perfect. Now I can look at that. But I, I want you to understand that wasn't always there. I also want you to understand that, unfortunately, at times, these separations of verses can murky the waters. Okay? See, the concept of when you have verse 3, verse 4, verse 5... The verses contain a thought. And when you go to another verse, it's natural for you to respond that there's a new thought. This passage in yellow, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, does not belong in verse 3. It belongs in verse 4. And when you see verse 4, it's all one thought. And this is very important. So what we are going to do is we're going to carry this over to verse 4. I will put it on the top. And we will read it together. And so this is what we read. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Again, he does this contrast. But here's what I want you to see as we, as we look at this statement. Although the works were finished from the foundation... Go back to the foundation of the world. What do we know happened? It's called creation. Six days he created heaven and earth. And then the Lord ceased. He ceased. So the works were finished from the foundation. Of the world, and then the writer goes in for the kill here, if you will. Because his focus is the Shabbat. His focus is the Shabbat. And notice, God himself rests. He himself rests. This is, this is the key word that you need to pick up on. This is the primary object. This is the primary theme of going into chapter 3 and even into chapter 4. It's all about God's eternal rest. So, as we look at this, we, we see the writer brings the seventh-day Sabbath to the table. What are we supposed to get out of this? Because this is very intentional. There's no question about it. Well, to help you... Uh, really begin to understand this, what I want to do is I want to take you back to Genesis. I want to take you back to Genesis. The writer is quoting Genesis 2. 
And it is always helpful if you're navigating through the New Testament and you see a quote, it's always helpful to go back and get the context because there's a backstory here that the writer has and understands something that his audience, okay, so you have a Jew writing to Jews, there's a backstory here, there's a context that doesn't necessarily, it's not going to make it into the letter. I mean, how many emails have you written where there's a backstory, there's a context, there's things that are assumed that your audience will know because you've been talking to them and you know where they come from. See, this Jew writing this, he knows where his peoples come from. He knows what they had. So I want to go back there. And this is what we read in Genesis 2, verse 1. Thus, the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Now, isn't that interesting? Because what did the writer of Hebrews just quote? The works were finished from the foundation of the world. See, this is where he's drawing this statement from. He's taking you back to creation. So they were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and look at this, he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. Moving to verse 3. Then God, what did he do? He blessed the Sabbath day, okay, the seventh day, and he sanctified. Okay, it's not just blessed. He blessed it and sanctified it, and there is a reason. Because in it, he rested from all his work which he had created and made. Understand something. The writer's bringing the Shabbat, something that his people have been acquainted with from the beginning. They were always keeping Shabbat. Coming out of the, uh, out of the Exodus, they were immediately commanded. This is the first commandment they were given. Before you ever get to Exodus 19, you have Exodus 16. They were given the command to keep Shabbat. And so this is their culture. This is their history. And here we see that it is blessed and sanctified. What does sanctified mean? Set apart. It's completely set apart. Now you think about this for a second. Think about these elements that we're presented with here. They are completely prophetic. They are pointing to, they're telling, it's telling of God's eternal rest, the Sabbath millennial rest, as they would say. Okay, so... We know the Sabbath is blessed. What do we know about the Sabbath millennial reign that is coming? This Sabbath rest. It is going to be blessed. When you think blessed, I think no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more death, no more stabbings, no more car rammings, no more missiles being lobbed into Israel. None of this is going to happen. I mean, it's the very definition of, of blessing. We need to look at this. There's a reason he's bringing this in, the Shabbat, in this inaugurated eschatology context. It's representative, ultimately, of the final Shabbat in a very, very powerful way. And not just that, you also, we also know it's sanctified. It's sanctified. What do we know about the age to come? The age to come is God's eternal rest, it is going to be completely separated from this age, this wicked and evil age. So when you think about this reality and think about how profound that just that, that, the, the implications of this and what the Sabbath really represents and how connected it is to God's eternal rest, you understand exactly why the writer would bring this to the, to the table. I mean... Every time we enter into the Shabbat, we're entering into Bible prophecy. You are literally clothing yourselves in Bible prophecy because what we do today is a rehearsal of what's coming, and it is coming very soon when you look at where we're at in time. Every time we enter into Shabbat, we're completely set apart from the rest of the week. There's total sanctification. See, Time, the, the time we have in Shabbat is a time of redemption. We're redeemed from the rest of the week. And think about this. This is just the reality. We're literally, in a very realistic and a practical level, we are redeemed from the curse that was placed upon us in the garden. See, because the curse was placed upon man that by the sweat of his brow, he's going to eat bread. He has to toil and labor because of his sin. But on Shabbat, you are released from the curse, from the curse of God. 
And you think about what is coming and being released from sin and death. I mean, that is a blessing. That is amazing. And it's completely set apart. These worlds do not cohabitate. You think of Deuteronomy 15, the year of release. Do you know when that happens? Every seventh year. Every seventh year, there is a year of release. Every single week, we experience release. We experience the Shemitah in, the, in, the, in that context. There is a release from the world, the oppression of sin, the bondage of sin, we're completely taken out of. I mean, seven is very, very instrumental in Scripture. When you look at it, very instrumental. You think we have six days, and then we have the seventh day. Okay, we're released, total bondage, totally. There are 6,000 years that are given in this age. 6,000 years, but then the 7,000th year, we are set free. This is awesome stuff. As we go back, I want to go to 2 Peter 3.8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. This statement is explicitly made in the context of Bible prophecy in the day of the Lord. One day is as a thousand years. Every day that was marked out in creation, six literal days that the Lord worked, represent this age and our time in this age and working in this age. But the seventh day, there is rest. There is release. There's freedom. There's liberty. We do not have to go through this anymore. I mean, it's so blessed. And not just that, so you, you think about how, how significant the number seven is. Look at your calendars, pull them out. What is the end of the week? Shabbat. What's the last day? What is the last day of the week? It is Shabbat. Well, that's interesting because we read in John 6, 39, this is the will of the Father who sent me that all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up when? At the last day. So when you understand what this writer of Hebrews understands in regard to this, it, how our week cycle mimics the cycle of this entire age, how the current Shabbat that we experience every seventh day mimics that of what is coming very, very soon where we enter into that, the last day. He's going to raise it up. This is the resurrection of the dead. This is when we enter into that eternal rest. And this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. You know, one of the things that has always fascinated me as I began to investigate the Shabbat, this is over 18 years ago now, but as I began to investigate the Shabbat in, in doing all the research and all the writings that the rabbis had given is how they viewed the Shabbat, how they observed the Shabbat, what the Shabbat meant to them. I mean, it almost seemed to me, and this was, this was the knee-jerk reaction as I'm going through all this literature and talking to Jewish people, it almost seemed to me that nothing else mattered except the Shabbat. And, and, and the first reaction is like, man, they're, they're making all this fuss about this. It's like, that's all they want to talk about. That's all they care about is this Shabbat, this Shabbat. Everything else is vanity to them. And, and, and their entire week is met with anticipation. Not for Tuesday, not for Wednesday, not for Thursday, but the entire week is met with anticipation for the Shabbat. Their preparations, everything revolves around Shabbat. Everything that they do, everything's designed by that. They are so intentional about what they do. It's really an amazing thing. And one of the things that struck me the hardest, and it put it all into perspective, and this is before I really appreciated the prophetic nature of the Shabbat representing our eternal rest with God, entering into that, is this. For a Jew, Shabbat is about going home. For a Jew, it's about returning from exile. You just go back and read the stories as the Jewish people are coming home from exile, from being exiled from Babylon, coming in and exiling them. They were homesick. Now, if you've ever 
been away from home for an extended period of time and we have soldiers that go to war. Inside, they're dying. It's, it's amazing to the point where th- there's these testimonies of soldiers saying, you know, talking about, yeah, you know, we got bullets whizzing by their head, but all they can think about is missing their family. They want to go home. You need to understand the true context of Shabbat is, and what our desire should be, is we want to go home. That's what we need. We need to be homesick. And so that's why seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's all that matters. Everything else should be vanity to us. I mean, the Jewish people have amazing how God has preserved his Shabbat among his people and how they embrace it with such joy. No matter what's going on in the week, they just want to get to Shabbat. They do, because the week's hard. There was war. There was tribulation. This is just like in our life. There's war and tribulation in this life. But we're totally to disconnect from that. We're to be sanctified. We're to be set apart from all of that. No worries, but casting all our cares upon the Lord on the Shabbat. I just want to share with you a traditional song. When I talk about this, I like to share this song that is read on Shabbat. So as the Jews are entering Shabbat, you want to see how prophetic this is. This is what we read. Lecha dodi likrat kala. And all that means is come my beloved to meet the bride. This is what they're, they're, the Jewish people are singing this song. They're declaring prophecy. See, because the Shabbat is prophetic of us ultimately entering into the kingdom of God, that final rest. I'll just read a little bit of this song. Come, let us go to meet the Sabbath, for it is a wellspring of blessing. From the beginning, from of old, it was ordained, last in production, first in thought. You think about that. Yes, it was last in production. It's the final thing the Lord did in creation that would constitute seven days of creation. Okay, it was the last thing he did, but it's first in thought. O sanctuary of our king, O regal city, arise, go forth from thy overthrow. Long enough hast thou dwelt in the valley of weeping of Becha. Verily, he will have compassion upon thee. Shake thyself from the dust. You remember what Yeshua said in regard to the last day? I'm going to raise you, raise you up at the last day. That is the resurrection of the dead. This statement is, it pertains to the resurrection of the dead. Because in Isaiah 26, we're to awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. Shake thyself from thy dust. Arise, put on the garments of thy glory, O my people. Through the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, draw thou nigh unto my soul and redeem it. So when we look at this statement, we're just breaking into this. Although, or and yet, the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. You're getting a little bit of taste, a little bit of backdrop of the prophetic implications of why he's bringing this to the table. And as we continue, we're not going to, we're going to close today for now. But as we continue, we're going to take this farther and farther. And we're going to get deeper into this.